Welcome to the Rock the Stage Show. Each week, international media expert Rich Bontrager has in-depth and personal conversations with celebrities, top leaders, authors, speakers, and media professionals. Now, from the Rock the Stage studios, here's your host, the Trigger, Rich Bontrager. Welcome back at Sunday Night Rock the Stage Show here once again, 7 p.m. Eastern Time, always bringing you amazing guests, stories, and we've got a very, very special one for you tonight. We've done celebrities, actors, we've done authors, we've done entrepreneurs. But tonight we're going to step inside organized crime and mobsters. We're going to do a real life story of the boogeyman tonight. And tonight is actually part one of a two part series. The story is so in depth, so amazing, and it's all true that we want to bring you as much as we could in two parts. This conversation was so fascinating, we could not stop the tape because. Gunner gave us so much information. So tonight, we're going to introduce you to Gunner Allen Lindblom. He is an American author, entrepreneur, former convict, who's gained recognition after his release from prison in 2016. He is best known for his novels, particularly the To Be a King series, which explores themes related to organized crime. Lindblom was a career criminal known as the Boogeyman, and in 2003, age 29, he was convicted of extortion, bank robbery, and then sent to prison. Now, during his time in prison, he wrote nine novels, drawing on his personal experiences as a gangster. Upon his release in 2016, Lynn Bloom began publishing his works and quickly gained attention for his To Be a King series, which is set in the world of the fictional the Detroit Mafia family. Tonight, you're going to hear about his old family a real mafia family, really from the Detroit, and what his upbringing was like and how he went from just an average street kid to a muscle man and much more. Tonight, you're going to hear Boogeyman, Gangster Redemption, Part 1. Sit back and enjoy our conversation tonight, and be sure to join us next week for Part 2 of this amazing story. Again, tonight, Gunner Allen Lindball. Welcome to Rocks the Stage. Hey, thanks for having me. Appreciate you. You you have a very exciting and dare I say colorful story, but it's it's also a big story of transformation. Did you ever think back in your younger days you would have this transformation story? No, certainly not. I I um you know, I'll admit there was a part of me that knew I had a talent, a special talent. I knew it revolved on all my creativity and things like that. It's a very good storyteller whether it was just recounting stories from fights I got into or just coming up with, you know, BS on the fly to, to get out of trouble with my girlfriend. Okay, Gunner. So storytelling and movies are a part of your personal story as well. But before we get deep into this, let's go back and reset this for everyone. Let's start at the beginning. How did it all really begin for you? There was mentally ill, manic depressive. And my father was an abusive alcoholic and they divorced when I was four. So I, I ended up moving in with my grandparents. I moved in with him when I was uh, four, I think. Okay. And, um, and I, you know, it was an interesting childhood because I, I think I knew all along something was different, but I didn't know what, it was just my family. <laughs> so one day a young girl said to me, I asked her, why didn't she invite me to her birthday party? And she says, my mom said you're in the mafia. And I said, uh, I don't even know what that is. You know, I'm five years old, or whatever it was. You know, wow, maybe at five years old, that got thrown at you. Well, yeah, the the, the mother of this girl said, you know, don't invite <sighs> him to the mafia, and I don't even know what that is. So I asked my uncle Pete. Now, my uncle Pete was like an older brother. He lived with us. He was only twelve years older than me, so he's like just an older brother, really. And I asked him. I said, "What's the mafia?" And he says, "Oh, don't worry, you'll find out. It's our family." And so now I start paying closer attention to the men coming and going and Cadillac yeah. and Lincolns, the, the pinky rings, the knots of money, the cigars, the hush conversations in the back room with the door shut, speaking in Sicilian, the phone calls, the people come with the way people treated my grandfather and my uncle. They go to the store and nobody would take their money. They give them like two handed handshakes. Hey, Pete, how you doing, buddy? And they kiss him on the cheek. Oh, no, no, no. Your money's no good here. You know, I'm going to take anything. whatever you try to buy. They just give it to you. See, oh, oh. because because I've, I've heard a lot of mafioso stories, films, mm -hmm. movies, and there's always the neighborhood. They love, oh, yeah. they want to help the neighbor and everything yeah. else, but it's in conflict with the criminal life they get into. But they always want to help the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's, that's exactly that's, that's so counter, isn't it? Well, honestly, uh, in hindsight, looking back at it, I think my grandfather. Well, honestly, I know this is a fact that my family was ashamed to be associated with the mafia, oh. even though they they were, even though people, you know, gave them extra praise and respect and and all kinds of perks. They they didn't like it. They didn't like being associated with the mob. They and they you know they were a, the next level type of mafioso. The boss and his constituents all went to college and had college degrees. So these are next level mobsters. All right, you're talking about next level mobster family that that you are deeply connected to. So were they proud of that? Not proud of that? How did that really play out in real everyday life for you? They weren't necessarily proud to be associated with this organized crime and criminals yeah. and scumbags. So they did a lot of uh, community work, a lot of donating uh, church money, church foundations. Yep. My grandfather was the head of the Young Men's Club and then eventually the um, American Legion there. Uh, they were all, also uh, donated a ton of money to, to you know charities in the area to try and distance themselves from, from the right. mafia. You know? yep. But there's no escape because... Their last name was Toko, and everybody knew, you know, <laughs> the boss was, was Jack Toko. But um, anyway, so as I grew up around this, I started paying attention. And around the age yep. 12, I think, uh, I saw The Godfather, the movie The Godfather. Yeah. And uh, and I was I remember distinctly, I was at my Uncle Joe Toko's house. I was sitting there with my cousin Patrice and my cousin Jerry and my mother and a few other people there, and we watched it, you know. Now, the whole time, I'm watching it going... <laughs> This is basically our family, you know what I'm yeah. saying? Like wow. you, uh, Uncle Nicky is like Luca Brasi, I mean, all these guys. I'm like these, and I, I'm like, I, so I start to think to myself, so that's what we are. We're 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 criminals. Like we're my family is a bunch of criminals. So now what does that I, do to you? We, I mean, you're watching a major the, hit film, but it's reality for you. What's that? Yeah, like and well, I mean, it wasn't like completely parallel. Uh, obviously, Hollywood aggrandized it, right? And, but, still getting the feeling. but it was it was it was close it was very it yeah. was very i i will say the producers and the director of that film uh uh mario puzo was the writer and um francis ford coppola is the director they did a really good job because it was authentic it was very authentic the real life of my real life was similar to that and um and i watched but i was like a fly in the wall you know because i was right. a kid so i'm watching this this unfold and now it, it does have a huge impact on me Okay, so you say you had a big impact on you, but what was your childhood really like growing up in all this? I mean, how did you behave? Uh, how did the whole family get along? Well, how what did you do with all of this? So it, it affected me in the fact that I say, hey, well, you know, we're criminals, and not only are we criminals, but people respect it and admire it and look up to it. So I'm like, okay. So I see that's how it works. And then around the same time, maybe 12, 13 years old. Yeah. I, my mother moved us out of the house with my grandparents. We got our own house, but my mother is mentally ill and she, we lived in squalor. We were on welfare. Mm. It was horrible, it was dirty, filthy. But every weekend we'd drive back to the old neighborhood, which is like 15 miles away. And we'd spend Friday, Saturday and Sunday at my grandparents and we'd eat normal and we would do the laundry and they'd send us home with a bunch of food or whatever. And I get to go see all my cousins and friends in the neighborhood. Right. But on the way there one day, I see this mini bike on the side of the road it says, hundred dollars and i want that mini bike bad so i get to my <laughs> my grandparents house my uncle pete's there and he's with his boombodies his paisans his, his friends you know and i say uncle pete man i want this mini bike really bad buy me this mini." now i had gone to the eastern the eastern market is like detroit's little italy so yeah. that's where my grandfather's business was this was the headquarters of the mafia it's where the epicenter of italian culture in detroit was the eastern market and my uncle would always say, come on, Alonzo, come with me. He, he's the one who called me, always called me Alonzo. Nobody else called me Alonzo because my name's Alan, you know, and Alonzo. Yeah. So he'd take me down there and he, I like hang out with him and his friends and they were playing dice and, and poker and, and smoking cigarettes and, you know, dealing drugs, talking about girls, and be, you know, beautiful girls were coming and going and they'd always like have knots of money and you're throwing it on the table, rolling dice, bang and laughing. Very, they're always super funny and gregarious. And that, left a mark on me because i'm like damn i want to be like these guys and they wore track suits you know and, and uh, you know expensive track suits and they look cool big gold chains and oh yeah I, i'm like i like like i admire that i'm like i want to be like them so anyways i get to my house with the mini bike thing and i said uncle buy me he said i'm not buying you no mini bike man he's like but i'll tell you how to get the mini bike i said well, how 
He says, you know the Jerry Lewis charity where you hand, that they shake the yeah. can? Yeah. Did you like to donate to Jerry Lewis? I said, yeah. I, you know, they got the cans at the at the Seven Eleven liquor store, whatever. Yeah. He said, Go get you one of those cans. Stand out in front of the store, shake the can. And when you get your enough money to buy your mini bike, you, you you go buy your mini bike. So, I I go home and I stand in front of this. I get one of those cans from the store yep. owner, and I stand there for like two hours and I only make ten bucks. I'm like, I'm gonna be here forever. So in my industrious little mind, I said, there's a Kmart literally like eight miles away, which is a long ways for a 12 year old to go on a bike. You know what I'm saying? A long way. It's like three cities over, you know what I'm yep. saying? But I know the way there. So I kind of know. So I said, I'm going to go stand in front of this Kmart and shake this can. So yeah. I get, I don't even, my mom, she was mentally ill. She was probably sleeping. Never even knew I left, you know? And I, Drive eight miles. I stand in front of this uh, Kmart for like five hours. I fill this can like four times. <laughs> I dumped it in the bed in a bag, and and then when I left, I tied the bag of money to yeah. my my handlebars, and then drove back. I dump it out. I count it. I got one hundred and forty bucks. So I, I put a hundred aside for the mini bike. I put ten back in the can to, to donate, and kept thirty bucks. I'm like, wow, this is great. So, so, but you know, honestly, I knew, I knew something, I was doing something wrong. So I'm not going to say, you know, but as a kid, you're young and impressionable. And the, and, and if the person you look up to tells you this is okay to do, then you're like, you know, man, this so, guy. So, so that kind of, kind of got you into the family business. That was your first taste of, I can sure. make money, yeah. give, give some back and go do it again. Yeah, so I never did it again after that. I just got my mini bike. I called my dad. <laughs> I, said, I said, Dad, I got I, I gonna go get that mini bike. You know, I got the money. He said, Where'd you get the money? I said, Uncle Pete gave it to me, which is you know <laughs> only, only a half lie. And then, but there's there's other instances like not around the same time. So you're starting the, the impression in my mind. Yeah. They're starting to you know form my mind, like mold it, malleable. So the influence of the family is beginning to have a deeper impact on you. It's it's rolling on and rolling on. Your behavior patterns have probably begun to change at this point. Your decision making has begun to change. But when did you begin to really feel that you were moving deeper into the family business, as they say? You know, then fast forward a couple of years, and I'm around 15 years old. My uncle says, Hey, listen, I need you to do something for me. I'm like, What? He's like, I just need you to go into this place, this restaurant every week and get a check. That's it. Yeah. They're going to have you on a payroll as a baker. You're not going to be baking nothing. You're just going in to get this money. Well, it turned out the manager of the place, which is a high-end restaurant called Bobby Moore's Blind Fish. Very high-end. One of the few five-star restaurants, like, on the east side, right? Yeah. Um, the owner was a huge Coke dealer, but I wouldn't learn that till years later. But uh, the manager, Harry, was, uh, was you know, the, the owner's, like, boy. The problem is he was a gambling degenerate. So he got into debt with my oh. uncle. Now he was, like, 20 grand into debt with my uncle. So my uncle says, well, let's figure out a way you can start chunking this off. Yeah. He says, all right. And he tells him, have your nephew come in here. I'll pick up a $300 check every week as a baker, and I'll chunk it off that way. My uncle said, go on there. I'll give you 50 bucks. You pick up the $300 check. You get 50. You don't got to do nothing. Well, one day I'm coming out of there, right? And the, the place was famous for its perch. Yeah. Um, you know, like, you know, back then, even a platter of perch was like 15, 17 bucks. Today it would be like 50 but anyways, I, I come walking out one day and I was a big fisherman because we live right by the lake. I lived across the street from the lake. And I I saw this big box of perch, frozen perch uh, uh, fillets, not frozen. They were actually fresh and they dump them on the scale. And then they, they on this big, like big metal stainless steel, like scale thing. And they start weighing up like whatever it is, five ounces per serving, whatever. Yeah. And I'm looking at them and I'm going, I those look just like white white perch fillets and i'm like i can catch white perch by the thousands man like le legitimately and so i mean we we would go out in a boat and follow the white perch schools they're called white bass or white yeah. perch and when you flay them down they're just like big perch fillets so and, that's a new business opportunity that's a new business oh yeah opportunity yeah to jump we right would into. we would catch so many that the boat would start to sink no, I'm not joking. The, the boat was was like down by the water level, like this. We said we got to go in. We need to have <laughs> five, six hundred of these fish, right? But anyways, so I tell Harry, hey, when I go to get my check, I say, hey man, I got some white perch that looked. How much are you paying for these perch? He's like three dollars a pound or whatever it was. Um, <laughs> and I, I said, I'll give you white perch for a dollar fifty a pound, and you can make how many pounds you need a week. He's like five hundred pounds or whatever it is. I'm like, I don't know if I can get you that many, but I can get you a lot. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. 
He's like, oh, people know the difference. I'm like, they won't know the difference. You know, if you want, if you catch them, you skin them and you flay them, you scale them and flay them or just whatever, clean them. He said, I said, put them on a plate, fry them up, send them out to people and then go out there and ask them, how'd you like the fish? And yeah. we'll see what they so they did. He's people love it. Oh, they're delicious. They're, I'm like, yeah, the same fish. Maybe another extra bone or two in there. But other than that, so I we we would catch a couple garbage cans of them, uh, use a wagon to drag them down to this place called Samson's Fish Market. They charge yeah. thirty bucks, thirty cents a pound to fillet them and put them on ice in a box. And yeah. then I I had a friend named Carl who had a car, and I I'd, I'd say Carl, you know, I'll give you twenty bucks to drive me to the restaurant. So all in all, I was selling these things for about $1.50 a pound and profit, me and my couple of my friends. And it was a great racket. And it was like, this gets going. And I'm like, you know, my first real like hustle, like, you know, organized crime hustle was now, selling fake Now, purse. hang on for a second. Are, are, are you still doing the money run for $300 as well? Yeah. Yeah. Every week. So so you're doing both at the same time. Yeah. But I'm not getting 300 bucks. I only get 50 no. bucks. Right. But still, you're yeah. doing two operations. Okay. Yeah, I'm 15 years old and I'm pulling 50 a week from that. So you're still a teenager at this point. And it doesn't like school is really a big part of your life and things like that. So eventually you fall on the drugs and you keep going further and further into the family business. Is, is that kind of how it went down? No, I started to smoke pot and I hung around this kid named Jimmy, whose cousin, Joe, was a drug dealer, just a weed dealer. But he's kind of a big time guy to me. He had a low rider and a Mustang gold change. And he's like a kingpin to me. And um, he said to me one day, Hey, if you ever want to sell that jacket, my mother bought me for my birthday, this troop jacket, which is like a $300 jacket. They're very expensive. So yeah. my mother wanted to do something nice and got me. I never wanted to sell it, but the dude said, if you ever want to sell that, I'll give you half ounce of weed. So one day I'm at the house. I got nothing to eat. I'm starving. Um, and it's by this time I I'm uh, expelled from school i got expelled from eighth grade my second time around so i failed the first time eighth grade second eighth grade i get expelled uh indefinitely so i can't go to adult ed because i'm too young so i'm just at home all day and i'm like i smoke a little weed i'm hungry there's nothing in the house to eat and i remember that guy joe saying i'll give you half ounce of weed now here's the kicker i had this friend named sydney a black dude who lived in these black projects this yeah. is we called we called it the panic zone it was a very dangerous neighborhood all black projects uh, maybe four or five miles from my, not even probably three miles from my house. Um, I go over to his house, Sydney's house and roll up a joint. And I'd smoke a joint with him and his brother and his cousin. And we'd hang out, but they'd always go, man, sell me some of that weed. You white boys, I got the good weed. You always got the good weed. And I'm like, you know, and I don't want to sell you my weed. It's my weed to smoke, but I'll sell you a joint. I'll smoke one. No, sell me, sell me. I'm like, no. And I'm like, and, and they, their boys would walk in. They were crack dealers back then. Crack dealers would sit on the corner there would be like 10 of them up and down the block and they'd be on the corner. Yeah. You just pull up and go, how many you want? And they two, 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 whatever. And these guys, you know, always had six, 800 bucks in their pocket. They were making that every day. So they'd see me and go, you know, sell me that bag. I'm like, I'm not selling it. And they're like, give me two joints. I'll give you 20 bucks or whatever. I'm like, okay, 20 bucks. <laughs> so I got it in my mind. If I can get a half ounce of weed and go flip it, then I can start making money feeding myself. Okay. So from there now, you're beginning to start selling weed, you're using weed yourself, and you're building this reputation as a drug dealer, an actual real drug dealer. But eventually, you're now also going to move into the steroid business. And back then, steroids were big, big business, right? Around 17, I wanted, I started, you know, wanting to get girls, but I was real skinny and gangly. So I started working out, and that led me to getting involved in the steroid business. And wow. that, that led me to selling steroids until I ended up getting busted with this big, huge organized crime uh, steroid bus. Um, that guy's name is Joe DiMaggio. It's public, so it's not a big deal. It, but it was huge. At the time, they said it was the biggest steroid bus in American history. Uh, there was 55 guys, eight states, three different countries, yes. eight million in cash, millions of doses of steroids. I had no idea it was that big. I just knew it was this older Italian guy. And by older, I mean, he was 29. At the time, he was 29. So I'm, keep in mind, I'm only 17. So to me, he's like <laughs> an old man. But this guy had big boats and big cars. And all his crew were these big muscle bit of drove Mercedes and stuff. And I just assumed they were like mid-level mafia guys because they're all Italian. And and, yeah. and and he knew my uncle. And that's how I got in with him. I said, hey, I'm Pete Toko's nephew. And he said, oh, I know Pete. I know his sisters. I'm like, yeah, that's my mom. One of them's my mom. So they gave me a chance and put me in the game. But then he gets busted and I get busted. All right. So now you're busted. You're still a teenager. And it sounds like things are really, really beginning to pick up. 
And this reputation is taking on a life of its own, right? I mean, you're building a criminal record. You have a rap sheet that's growing bigger and bigger, right? Basically, yeah. in, in the period of time between ages like 14 and 17, I've been convicted of seven or eight felonies. So I had so, a bunch of, my record was terrible. And I, I, I had been like three different felonious assaults, uh, destruction of property, receiving concealing property, um, uh, uh, interfering with a police investigation, I don't know, all these different charges. And so when I got the steroid bust, the prosecutor's going, this guy's a menace to society. I mean, he's only 17. He's got eight felonies. We want to put him, in, I mean, we want to send him to prison. So when I told this to my grandfather, like, or my uncle, I sent it to my uncle Sal. I said, uh, you know, this is crazy. And then would put me in prison over this steroid thing. And he tells, he comes to me, he says, grandpa's going to take care of it. I said, what's he going to do? He's like, he's going to have lunch with the judge. I said, do what? He's like, don't worry. He'll take care of it. He, he didn't so, say that. He looked at me like, you know what he's going to do, stupid. So, 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 so hang on for a second. Because you're still a juvenile with all that record. You're still uh, a juvenile. No, and then that's it. I get it. I get. I fought it for eighteen months. I was busted at seventeen. By the time oh, I was so it rolled over. Okay. Yeah, I was. Uh, they were charging me as an adult. Yeah, okay, that's what I want to clarify yeah. for everyone because everything else was juvenile, juvenile. It's a different yeah. game when you're an adult now. Yeah. Well, exactly. So they're gonna, they're gonna, they're charging me as an adult. Want to send me to prison? But my grandpa sits down with the judge. Apparently, gives him ten grand to say, "I don't want my grandson to go to prison." Here's ten grand. So they sentenced me to county time in the jail. And some interesting things happening at that time. One is I found God. I like I, God found me. He discovered me. Um, I don't know if you ever heard of the book, The Daily Bread. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. Daily, Very familiar. Daily, daily devotional. And I, yep. I, I I picked it up in jail, and it spoke to my heart in a way that I'd never been spoken to, and it it really opened my eyes. And um, just at, at that point in my life, I knew God was real. Like I, that's the time where I was like, God is real. And uh, he's here and he's like reaching out to me through this book because like everything it's saying is like speaking to my heart. And uh, but anyways, the, the most remarkable part about that is I read it every day until I went to court for a time cut. My girl paid a lawyer and try, was trying to get 34 days shaved off my sentence so I could come home early. It's a long shot. Probably not going to happen, but it was only 300 bucks for the lawyer. So I read this daily bread every single day. It's got three months worth of devotionals in it. Yeah. And I never looked at the next day to see if the next day said, because I'd be, but I said, well, what if I go home tomorrow? I get let out. I won't know what tomorrow's devotional is. And this thing had been touching me, man. So I decided to open up and flip to the next day. It was blank. The whole rest of the book was blank. It was all wow. blank. The whole so, like half, half of the book was blank. So, 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 so this is what people understand. The devotionals are like tiny little short page, a verse, mm -hmm. a summary, a little story. Mm -hmm. How did that get through to you when nothing else did? You had teachers, you had other people, you had lawyers. Why did that divine. get through to you that, yes, but explain it was divine that intervention. I, I was about to get in a fight over a, a dice game. So I sat down, calmed down. I looked on the floor and I seen it. It was open. I go, what's that? And I picked it up. God told me, pick that up, you know, and then read it. And I read it. It spoke to my heart. It was just, it said, you know, turn the other cheek or calm down and blah, blah. whatever it said. I was like, wow. And I, every day it spoke to my heart. So while I was in jail, I, I discovered that God is real. Now, I didn't know him. I didn't know Jesus. But um, so I get out of jail after six months. So you get out of jail in six months, which is a really, really short amount of time for what you did. But you've also had this beginning of this God experience. You've had things begin to change for you. What happened to your faith, to that God experience? Because a lot of people find it hard to go integrate back into society. Did that faith in God, did that encounter help you and keep you on the line? Or did you just revert back to what you were doing? But I was still bad. I, I, three days after I'm out, somebody fronts me 10 pounds of weed. The, a week later, somebody gives me $5,000 worth of steroids. I'm, and I'm back in the game. I'm just doing yeah. the exact same thing. I got girls sneaking in the basement every night. I'm just you now being a, being a thug life. You know, I'm living. Yeah. A, I'm not working. I'm not, I'm just hustling. And about this time, I have a cousin at a graduation party. And it was a big deal for the family. And my grandmother made me go. So I didn't want to go. And this is the girl graduating high school, you know. Um, I barely even knew her, you know what I'm saying? Over the years, I spoke yeah. to her senior, but I didn't you know, know her that well. I had a million cousins. And my grandma said, you got to go. And, and and when I didn't go, she beat my mother. Grandmother beeps me. I'm at the beach, like 
throwing a football around with my boys chasing girls. And I see my grandma be like, what's going on with her? And I, I said, what's up, grandma? She's like, why aren't you at Nina's party? And I'm like, well, oh, yeah, I forgot. She's like, you got to get there now and bring her a gift. And I was like, ah. So I go home, I change, and I put on a, like a slick outfit. And I'm on my Ninja. I got a crotch rocket motorcycle. Yep. I get a um, a nice card, graduation card, put a $100 bill in it. Keep in mind, I've only been out of prison like two weeks, three weeks. Right. My grandparents are sitting at this big table, this big round table under the circus tent, right? And there's a few mafioso at the table. One of them is a dude named Tony Giacalone. He's famous because he was the number one suspect in the Jimmy Hoffa disappearance. Oh, wow. Okay. He, he was the last. He was the person Jimmy Hoffa was going to meet the day that Hoffa disappeared. So, gotcha. Yeah, he was Tony Giacalone. They call him Tony Jack. And uh, and I knew he was like a high-level mob dude, but I didn't really know. You know, he's an old man. And to me, he's my grandpa's age. I knew Tony Jack was a high level. But I didn't know anything about his history with Jimmy Hoffa. I didn't know about, you know, that he was like one of the highest ranking, you know, mob bosses in the city. I didn't know none of that. I didn't care. And so, but I'm sitting at the table and I hear my grandfather say in Sicilian, I'm dancing with one of my cousins. They're on my feet, just like the godfather. They're dancing <laughs> on my feet. It was cute. I think that's where they got it. They like Alonzo, dance with me. And little girls, they'd sit <laughs> on my feet. I I dance with them, and um, so I hear my 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 grandpa say to Tony, who's sitting right next to him. Right. He said, uh, "Hey, hey, T Tony, you think you can find Alonzo some work?" And I hear, you know, when I hear Alonzo, I my ears tweak up. You know, I'm only ten feet away and I'm dancing with this little girl. And uh, he says, Tony says, yeah, sure, Pete, I can find him something. I'll find him something. And then my grandmother says, no, 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 no. He's, he's going to college. He's not going to, he don't need no job. And my grandpa says, well, he still needs a job. I'll help keep him out of trouble, you know, da, 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 da. And, and then I say, hey, listen, do I got a say in this? I speak up. And I'm like, do I got a say I in this? And this whole table of Sicilians, everybody's speaking Sicilian. And I don't speak Sicilian fluent, but I little, I kind of picked it out what was happening. She says, you know what we're talking about? And I said, yeah, yeah. Grandpa just asked Tony if you could give me a job. Yeah. And I and and my grandmother at that point slams her hand on the table. She's little, she's only four foot eleven, about 110 pounds. Yeah. She slams her hand on the table. She goes, I said, no, boom. He don't he he you don't need a job. He's going to school. And I and Tony and, and my my grandfather looked at each other and like, eh, no, whatever. So later on, I'm at back at the house after the party, and I say to my grand my grandpa when we're in private, I said, What's up with grandma? Why is she like so against me? Uh, Tony get me a job. And he's like, right. and he looks at me, he just looks at me and goes, Really? I said, What? He's like, you know what Tony does. And then I was like, Oh, you mean that kind of job? I didn't know you were talking about that kind of job. I thought you were talking like construction work or something. <laughs> no, he's and uh, you know, something. So a couple weeks later, the first, well, a couple weeks later, he comes to the house and he says, hey, listen, you know, the nightclub Brownies on the Lake. I've said, of course, I know it's the biggest, hottest nightclub in the city and, and on the whole east side of Detroit. It's right on the water. It's high end place. He says, listen, I got you a job. He's like, go in there. The guy's name is Al. Ironic, because that's what they call me, Al. And, but this yeah. guy's go in there, ask for Al. Tell him I said, you know. You're here. Look, Tony sent you for security. And, and I walk in there and I'm like a handsome young bodybuilder, tan. And I got yep. nice hair. I'm a good looking kid. But I was only 20. And I go, I say, hey, Tony Giacalone sent me in here, told me, uh, said that you're going to hire me to be the head of security. I did, Yeah, the way I worded it, I said, you're going to hire me to be the head of security. Not like give me a job work in security. You're going to hire me to be. And he goes, yeah. Tony Jack said that? Tony said, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he said, you wanted me to be his, your new head of security. He says, uh, okay. So he walks me in the back and he gives me some shirts and he has the numbers to all the other bouncers and you're in charge now. <laughs> so whoever was in charge got demoted and I became the boss. And so, but the place was a, a major mob hanging, like yep. major. So the, you had like three generations of mobsters. Like you had young guys that are anywhere from, you know, 18 to, to 25. Then you had guys 25 to 35. Then you had guys that are like, you know, 35 to 55 in there. So, and everybody knew everybody because they were all related. That's the thing about the Detroit mob. Everybody's related by blood or it's, marriage. Yep. It's, it's, it's all family, right? They it's always talk about yeah, the yeah. family connection. Yeah. That's the difference between like the, uh, the Detroit family and, and everybody else, all the other mob families. It's legitimately almost all exclusively either blood sanguine or, you know, or you're related to marriage. One or the other, but everybody knew everybody. And, but because they knew, I, they knew Tony Jack got me the job there. 
because they'd ask, you know, how'd you? And then, and then the Tony Jack came in there a couple of times, would sit by the door talking to me for like a half an hour. This is the like, this is the most powerful mob boss in the city. The boss, you never see him. He's on his right. throne in a mansion. You ain't yeah. never gonna see him anywhere, right? Maybe you might see him at a Tigers game or something, but that's about it. But Tony's in the street, and he's a killer, and he's they they believe he was responsible up to forty bodies. So I mean, he's this guy's a dangerous, high level dude, a huge drug dealer, huge millions of dollars, heroin. And so he's sitting there talking to this 20-year-old bouncer at the door. And people were like, what's the deal? I'm like, well, he's a toko. He's a toko. And they say, and their cousins would come in and say, hey, tell their other cousins, hey, this is my cousin Al Toko. And I'd say, I'm, you know, my last name's Limbloom. My mother is Grace Toko. I'm like, hey, you're still a toko. Your family, Gumbadi, Gujin, or whatever. Okay, wait a second. This is right out of every mob book, every mob movie that we've all ever seen. You are now tapped on, given a job within a bar that's known for being a mob bar. You're the bouncer. You're the head bouncer. You're the enforcer of the bar. So how long did it take you to get tapped on by the family to go do something for them? Because most bouncers end up being the enforcers. So how long did it really take you to get a phone call? Whatever they did back then. Weeks after I started that job, Tony calls me one morning. And this is uh this is where I get sucked in. He calls me one morning, it's like seven o'clock in the morning. I'm in the basement in my bedroom. I hear the phone ring and I don't answer. I don't know who the hell's calling the house at seven o'clock in the morning, right? I hear my grand my grandmother answer upstairs. She like angrily gets up and stomps towards the phone. And you know, it's about the time she was getting up anyways. And uh, she yells, Hello, or whatever. And and then a minute later, I hear footsteps above me go down to the top of the stairs. She says, Alonso. Tony's on the phone. I said, Tony who? Because I got like 10 Tonys in my family. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, Tony who? She's like, Tony Jack. Like she hated him. I don't know if she yeah. hated him. She didn't like him. She knew he was trouble and bad news. I said, all right. So I pick up my phone in the basement and I said, Tony? And he don't answer. And, I, and he waits for my grandmother to hang up the phone upstairs. I said, Tony, what's up? And he's like, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to handle something, he says. I said, what is it? Anything. I can handle anything. He's like, no, I need you to handle You sure you can handle it? I said, yeah, what is it? He's like, there's this girlfriend of mine. He didn't say girlfriend. It's this girl, a friend of yeah. mine. Probably it was Gumar, which is girlfriend. But, you know, he's married and I knew his wife. So I didn't want to, you know. <laughs> Anyways, it's, so he said, her ex-husband showed up at her house last night, slapped her and the kids around. Now he's there passed out drunk. Yeah. I want you to go get rid of him. And I said, okay, it's fine. You know, give me the address. I was, and I didn't even, like, I didn't ask why me. I was like, cool, I'll do this. But it happened only, like, it was only like three miles from my house. So, like, which made it, like, me the perfect person, you know. And plus, it was a test. I knew he was testing me. He was, like, going to see, all right, is this guy willing to get his hands dirty? You know, he's a he's a tough guy, that's for sure. He likes to fight. I've heard of rumors about him tearing up clubs and, and Nicky's Pizza and all these different But And I heard he's been in and out of jail a bunch of times, and he's gotten arrested in felonies and assault. So, you know, but is he really willing to get his hands dirty? So, he says, this guy's, and make sure you handle it. You can handle it. I said, yeah, I got this. Give me the address. See? He said, give me the address. It was right off 12 mile road. So I hang up the phone. I call my workout partner, an Italian dude named Dario. And I say, Dario, this is, this, this is a testament to the type of gangsters I hung around with. He was a big muscle bound guy and a tough guy. Yeah. And I said, Dario, get your gloves, man. We got business. Hurry up. And he says, first words out of his mouth. Do I need my piece? Which he means gun. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I said, no, 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 no. Just bring a, a pull stick or a bat or something. Yep. All. He's like, all right, I'll be there in five minutes. And I mean, like, he just woke up. He's like, I'll be there in five. Five minutes later, he pulls up, let's go. So we go to this house, and it was on as a flat, like a two-story, uh, like, house, you know, two-story unit. And and she was upstairs. I go up these metal stairs, saw, knocks off the end of the door. She answers the door. I said, where's he at? She's like, he's in the back. There's two little kids there, two little boys, you know, like seven, 10 years old boys, you know, yeah. good looking kids. I look at her and I said, get rid of them. Put them in a, another room. I'm like, I don't want, they don't need to see this. Yeah. It's her, it's her father, I think. So, right. uh, and so she walks and said, come on, boy, come on, boy. She locks him in another room. She says at the end of the hall, that door right there. So now Dario's got a pool stick, like he's unscrewed it. So he's got the heavy, yeah, two pieces. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I said, Dario, just, stay back let me handle this and um 
So I walk into the bedroom and it's a he's he's a big muscle bound tan dude like like I like I just assume he was like a construction worker or a roofer or something because he's real yeah. talent real tan both muscular and he's like thirty years old you know what I mean I'm twenty so he's an older dude and uh, but he had like longer hair not long hair but like, like kind of longer hair and he's in his underwear and he's passed out in this bed so I walk in there and I lean over the over him and I and I bang my hand on the like the headboard bang 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 I said time to get up man time to go let's go he rolls over me goes. Who the F are you? And I say, this is my exact words. I say, I'm the F and boogie man. I said, now let's go. And he said, he said, eh, get the F out of here, kid. <laughs> and, he, and he rolls over. He said, get the F out of here, kid. He rolls over and goes back to sleep. So I grab him with my left hand by his hair. And I yank him like out of the bed hard, right? And I'm just going to drag him out. But he starts fighting. He sw starts swinging on me. So I just, oh, another thing is I had this huge gold ring on, huge ring, this massive nugget oh. ring, like a giant massive gold ring, huge. And it had two diamonds in it. It was, it was a, like a brass knuckle. And I just start smashing them. So I just, I said, wham, 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 pounding his face in, right? He, 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 after three or four punches, he's kind of just goes limp, you know? And I, dra I'm dragging him out. And he's like, all right, man, enough. All night. I'm dragging him by the hair. I drag him through the hall. And there was blood splattered all up in the wall. Oh. He was a mess. Like, I smashed his face in with this ring. And then I drag him out down the stairs, clunk, 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 down the stairs. And I said, now go. And if you come back here, ever put your hands on this woman, uh, I'll kill you. Right. And so, so so he goes, gets in his van. There's a brown van. He gets in it. First thing he does, he's got the mirror. And he looks at his face. He goes, look what you did to my face. I'm holding the door open. I said, Next time you put your hands on this woman, you need a surgeon to put your face together. Now get the F out of here. He shuts the door, and but he starts reaching under the seat for something, right? Oh, I no. See him, I see him reaching. Now, I freak out. I yank the door open and grab his hand. Bang, he's got a crowbar in his hand. And I yeah. yank it out of his hand. I said, man, you trying to die here today? And I'd like flinch him with it, you know? And uh, I said, get the freak out of here, my effort. And he's like, my face, get my face. I don't care about your face, man. Look at him, crack your head open. And he dives off. Now, the girl, I, I, I look at her and she mouths the words, thank you. She says, thank you. Yeah. And, and I leave. That's it. Now, I know she goes to Tony and reports back, you know, you know, whoever that kid was you sent over here, he was. But, he was, but he that's was the beginning of the boogeyman, right? That's, yeah, that's, that's pretty, where the boogeyman was born. That's pretty much when the boogeyman was born. Yeah. yeah. So, so pause for a second because what did you realize the transformation you're going for? Did you realize at that moment you had crossed a new line? No, didn't. No, I had no idea. But uh, really, no idea. I just was doing me. I was just doing what I do. Doing what I. I was a tough kid. I liked to fight. I hated bullies. It just fit. The, I was the puzzle piece they needed. Like some of these guys needed. So for the next ten years, I would get called upon on and off to do stuff like that. So where did that? encounter with god go during that did that pop back up was there a conflict there or were you just off another line that the whole god encounter was gone now no here's the thing that's an interesting question uh no one's asked me and that's a good one but no i i i did still believe in god i yeah. did i i did i wasn't walking with god in a way but but i did pray to him almost every day so i did believe in god but i wasn't you know practicing and walking yeah but like i said my entire 20s I started using drugs on and off. Um, the first time is when I broke my knuckle in a fight at a bar at a, a biker club. I got in a fight and broke my knuckle and they gave me pain pills. And I was like, oh, these are great. I love these things, you know. <laughs> and, 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 then, and, and so I got addicted to them. But then I went to jail about six months later for a pistol. Yeah. Uh, and got it was just two weeks in jail, but it cleaned me up, got me off drugs. And then I was clean for four years, you know. And then my best friend died um at age 24 and so that broke me and i and i turned to drugs to dull the pain of mm. my best friend his name is jason battaglia an italian kid real good looking italian kid i've been my best friend since i was 14 and uh, um he died of an overdose of all things and the first thing i do is go get high to deal with him and so then i got arrested again uh you know six nine months later and cleaned up and i'm clean for a couple of years and then uh i broke my ankle and they give me more pain pills and it's off running and this kind of was the towards the end and um ultimately i at the end i was i was doing maniacal stuff just like i you know you when you come to terms with the fact that you're 
you're a gangster or you're a criminal, whatever. Yeah. You know, call it what you will. You've accepted this. You know, this is my life. I'm not going to be something else or a businessman or nothing. This is just who I am. Yep. When, when the chips are down and, and, and you're broke and you got yeah. this life, lifestyle to maintain, I had a, just bought my second house, a beautiful house. Um, I had two, three cars, snowmobiles, four wheelers, dirt bikes, jet skis. I had all these toys. My house was beautiful. I was, and I bought it when I was like 28, 28 years old. I bought this beautiful colonial house, five houses off the water. Now, you know, I didn't have a really even have a job, bro. I mean, right. I, I, I did have a, a sales job for a little while, but it was like work three hours a day. And, and that, <laughs> that was it. And, and I, and it was a great, cause I drove all over the city doing, you know, in-person sales pitching. Yeah. Um, so I was able to deliver drugs and pick up money and extort this person and rob that person and dr sell drugs. So anyways, you, you get to the point where you're like, Oh, I guess this is who I am. a gangster, you know? And I said, so I need money. I got to pay my bills. And so what do you do? You just, you pick up a gun and, and just, and you do gangster stuff, man. I start robbing. I started, I, I tried to start with bad guys, drug dealers and pimps, you know? So I, ro I robbed drug dealers and pimps for a year or whatever it was, you know, but I ran out. Now the, the, the whole city's terrified of me, man. There, okay. there was, there, there was a, there was a, there was a, what's the name of that? The, the show, The Wire. And there was yes, this, very familiar with the show, The yeah, Wire. Yeah. Great show. Well, the, there was a the black guy who would run around robbing everybody. Yeah. And then yeah. he was, um, yeah. What was his Not name? Bubba, but I know. Yeah, uh, I know who you're talking about. Yeah. He was like he, he was like that. I was that guy. So like everybody was scared of me, and, and nobody would like. I had guys that I wasn't. I wouldn't rob because I liked them. I right. respected them, and plus they were guys who could have you killed. Those guys I left alone, right? You know, guys that had the 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 mentality of if you were to rob me of twenty or fifty pounds of weed, I'll pay someone to kill you. So. Those guys I left alone, but it was always like the this the guys I knew weren't going to do nothing, and right. so I'd have them front me 10 20 pounds of weed and I just wouldn't pay them, or I'd go to their house, pretend I got the money to pick it up, and then I just punch them in the mouth, pull out a gun, and say, This is how it works, I'm taking this, and that was that. But eventually, you run out of people to do that to, you know. And I was hunting, I was hunting pimps on Eight Mile and Woodward. And I'd, I'd go get them and tell them, listen, I got a party tonight. I need a bunch of strippers or, you know, hookers there, you know, come to this room with that. Da, da, da. And then I walk in, I'd rob all the strippers and the pimp, everybody on the floor. And I'd take all their money. So you are Omar from the wire. You are Omar, exactly yeah, painting yeah. a picture of Omar. Yeah. What was it like to walk down the street and know you're the boogeyman and everyone knows you're the boogeyman? What's it like to honestly be in that space? Not good, man. Not good. It's uh, it's not good. It's, it's a you hate yourself. You hate what you've come to. You hate what you've resorted to. You hate that everybody around you is scared of you. You hate that you're a scumbag criminal, robbing, using drugs, dealing with scumbags. You got to drive around like a predator all day long, looking for people to rob and things to steal and what hustles. And it was, it was horrible. It's a horrible existence, horrible existence. And it's painful. And, and, but every day when I got in my car, I leave in the morning and I put a shirt and tie on or a suit Kiss my girl goodbye. Put a pistol in my waist. She always go, "Why you got that pistol?" I'm like, "Yeah, better to have it, and not need it, than need it, and not have it." And I, dude, bro, I've been shot. I had a yeah. gun put to my head, I, and I've been shot a couple times. I had a guy put a gun to my head and pull the trigger, and it went click. And so, I mean, it, I, yeah, that's it's, it's crazy. Cra I'll tell you that story in a second. But but I would leave the house and get in my car, and I'd back out, and I would turn the stereo down, and I would pray for 20 minutes. That's going to do it for tonight. We're going to snap the story right there with Gunner as things are continuing to unravel in his life being raised in a mob family, becoming a part of the mob as a gangster and making his own rules and traveling through life. But with this conflict going on, he knows it's not really the right thing, but he's in the gang. Join us next week for part two of The Boogeyman, the gangster redemption story featuring Gunnar Allen Lindblom. It's an amazing story of trans transformation. And you're going to hear how he becomes an author and his amazing book, To Become a King, which became a series of books. Also, you're going to hear how he got out of organized crime and so much more in his life is forever changed. You're going to be surprised with some of the twists and turns. Join us back here, 7 p.m. Eastern time, and you can be a part of the live chat conversation as we do the watch party here once again on Sunday night. Thanks for joining us for a special two-part series looking at the life of Gunnar Allen Lindblom. 
That's going to do it for tonight. I'm the Trigger Rich Bond Trigger. Thanks for being with us, and we'll see you back here Sunday night at 7 p.m. Eastern Time for another Roxas Stage Show.